America was founded based on Christianity. Our DNA is Christian. Our roots are Christian. We aren't Muslim. We, we aren't uh, atheist. America is the greatest country that's ever existed, and it's because of Judeo-Christian values. How far have we come from the basic bipartisan agreement in favor of religious liberty? I had to choose between my job and my faith. And nobody in America should have to face that kind of decision. Does the goal of making America more Christian infringe upon the rights of other faiths? Yes. There's some movement that's happening towards a particular agenda, an ideology that I, I think is frankly quite harmful. When the hospital denied me medically necessary care, I was in shock. Using religion or any other excuse is not okay. The Christian right and their claims of religious liberty, they're not advocating for everybody's religious liberty. They're advocating for theirs. All of that has theological undertones that are deeply rooted in a dysfunctional and distorted view of Christianity. Ideas and notions of supremacy, superiority, and racial supremacy and superiority. Our country was founded as a Christian nation, but uh, we certainly are not that today. I decided to be a coach after uh, we went to a couple of Bremerton football games, and I thought I could make a difference with these young men. I didn't know a whole lot of the X's and the O's. I said, I know about team building, I know about developing young men, and I could do the leadership and character building of, of your football team. And they said, we got a lot of X and O guys, so yeah, this is exactly what our football program needs. I was one of those troubled youths that he didn't want to hang out with, you wouldn't want your kids to hang out with. Hey, how's your How are you doing? We used to break into houses, we'd steal stuff, we'd skip school, uh, get in a lot of fights. I went to a Catholic school until I got expelled and I kind of floated around and fought the system forever and really had not much of any faith growing up. I found my faith it was actually from my childhood sweetheart. She was uh, one of those good Christian girls, always went to church, and I was always that bad boy. Gotta pray that you just give him peace and comfort knowing that he's in your hands. My life has really changed since that moment, you know, when I started giving my life to God. And I said, I'm all in. And for the rest of my life, I'm gonna serve you, God. I started praying at the games at the very first game. When I first started praying, it was just myself. We would meet the other team out onto the 50 yard line, shake hands, and I would just take a knee there and say a quick prayer of thanks and continue on with the rest of the team. And after about six months, one of the kids asked me, can we join you out there? I said, well, this is America. Of course he could join me. You know, a couple of them came out and then more kids came out and then ended up being, you know, over the years, the entire team was coming out. It was never required to join in prayer. I never asked anybody, I never forced anybody. And I got warned over the years that, oh yeah, well we can't do that, teachers can't do that because we'll get in trouble. And I just kept saying, you know, that this is America. You are protected under these rights. It seemed ridiculous to me that anybody would ever get in trouble for something like that. They gave me the ultimatum. It was probably two hours before the game. They called me into the principal's office and they gave me the directive. And it says, if you pray on the football field, we will suspend you from, from coaching. Well, that was the one thing I just could not bend. I remember walking out to the 50 yard line and uh, took a knee. I'm saying, God, this is the last time I'm gonna be out here as a football coach. And that part just, devastates you. I know that I was called to be a coach. This was my joy in my life, being part of this. Now I had to choose between my job and my faith. 
And nobody in America should have to face that kind of decision. I'm not a legal expert and, or a constitutional expert. I just know what the First Amendment says. This nonsense about uh, separation of church and state has gotten way, way beyond the bounds of what the founders of our Constitution thought. Christians are tired of being bullied for their faith in the public square. The, the left, uh, the socialists, have made it very clear that they stand against the church. Unless we bow down and accept their agenda, you know, Mr. Mayor, we, we don't have government funding. All of this comes from God's people. So we just give glory to Him. Amen. Everybody staying healthy? Yes. Good. I do believe that there is an effort to take Christ, God, out of uh, the, public, the public square. And our country is uh, in trouble. We are more divided today since the Civil War. Only God can fix the problems we face as a country. And I think it goes back to uh, prayer in school. We've not only taken God out of, out of the prayer out of school, but we've taken God out of school, out of education. I believe Christians are being persecuted. I believe religious liberty is under attack, and we've seen that. Our country was founded as a Christian nation, but uh, we certainly are not that today. The United States Constitution actually does not say anything about the separation of church and state. They are implied, though. The Founding Fathers were much more concerned about the protection of churches. They didn't want the state to intervene in the lives of churches in preventing people from worship. There's a lot of debate to what extent can churches influence political life or public life. Really, people are not talking about whether or not America is a Christian nation or not before, say, 1980, before the Reagan era, before the rise of the religious right in the late 1970s. But it was really evangelicals, and I think their sense of victimhood after the cultural changes of the 1960s, the removal of prayer from public schools, the removal of Bible reading from public schools, the development of a more diverse nation with new immigration coming into the country, the fear of abortion. So what do Christians believe when they say religious liberty is under attack? Most of the Christian right approaches it as a political issue. There's a great spiritual awakening in America. Freedom is not America's gift to the world. Freedom is the almighty God's gift to each man and woman in this world. We all salute the same great American flag. And we are all made by the same almighty God. Right now, evangelicals make up about 20 to 25% of the United States population. They are a significant voting bloc. They're extremely influential, and they have convinced the overwhelming majority of white American evangelicals that indeed America is perhaps in jeopardy of losing that identity as a Christian nation. Christian nationalist is a, is a relatively new word. And I would argue that a Christian nationalist believes that Christianity was privileged at the time of the founding, and thus it should be always privileged. So those who fuse love of country, patriotism, with Christianity, and then develop a political philosophy built upon those beliefs that America is exceptional, and we need to build public policy around those convictions. Hey, brother, God bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here, sir. Here you go, hon. You, you found, you found Ardeen. Hey, you found Ardeen. Oh, you look great. I love the red. Thanks for loving my kid. You know, I'm a pastor's kid, so I grew up in a pastor's home. You ready? Let's do it. I met the Lord as a kid. You ready? 
and then rededicated my life to Christ as a college student. So my upbringing and, and my life has basically been in the Christian faith. You ready? You gonna sing? Yeah, I'm gonna invite right. I always had a deep faith that God was real and I could feel his spirit in me. I could feel his tug on my heart. And I wanted to serve him. God bless you. I'm, I'm excited about what God is doing. This is, a, this is a movement of gospel patriots happening in Tennessee, amen? Amen. Tennessee is going to be a hub of gospel-centered patriots. It's, I think, an incredible concept to name a church, Patriot Church, basically stating in the name that we love God, but we also love this country, and we're gonna fight for it. When I started Patriot Church, I knew I would garner a ton of criticism from the, those that don't believe in Christ and from many, many Christians. What I'm doing is so non-existent and being this blatant about it talking about things pertaining to the country. Heavenly Father, we pray for the service today. We want God in America again. And so Lord, use us as Patriot Church, as America's church. I pray that pastors would, would wake up and start fighting the good fight. We love you and praise you. And if you love Jesus and the United States, say, Amen. 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 Patriot Church says, we're in the fight. You know, what's going on in our nation right now, it's like, if you've ever seen the Lord of the Rings movie, and the orcs are, are released from the place of darkness, and did you know there's only one thing that can push back the darkness? And it's not Black Lives Matter. the left, they believe in abortion, we think it's murder. They believe in gay marriage, we don't believe that. We believe that there's one kind of love between a man and a woman that makes a marriage. So churches are trying to pretend like that divide isn't there, but we're not. We're, we're saying, hey, there is a divide, and we're gonna pick a side. Who won the election? Trump! By a... Trump has very much affected Patriot Church. I think 10 years ago, it wouldn't have worked, but right now, we're striking oil. You probably got like 80 million. You probably got like 80 million. We could lose that with the Biden presidency. As Christians, it means the loss of religious freedom. I would never say that I am a Christian nationalist. I think it has a connotation of, of some sort of racist or I think America is better than every other country. I hate that term. I do believe in being a nationalist versus a globalist. I do believe America is special because she chose to follow God and establish herself based on godly principles. Jesus, Jesus. America was founded based on Christianity. Our DNA is Christian. Our roots are Christian. We aren't Muslim. We aren't atheist. America is the greatest country that's ever existed and it's because of Judeo-Christian values. I think America is best off when we have Christians, good, solid, loving Christians in power, then everybody has freedom to worship how they choose. One of the implications of Christian nationalism is that to be a real American, to really belong, right, to really have access to the privileges that come along with this kind of status, right? It's not, it's not citizenship, it's that you're a Christian. People lose their lives, people are killed, people are attacked, right? Because they don't fit into that mold. I was raised Muslim in Brooklyn, New York. You know, members of my community have been targeted by the police, right? They have been arrested, they've been imprisoned for their beliefs. Our political beliefs, our religious beliefs, our kind of racial affiliations are all kind of targets. But the thing about the sort of Christian right and their claims of religious liberty is that they're not advocating for everybody's religious liberties. They're advocating for theirs. 
and they're advocating for theirs to be the norm, to be what is dominant, to be what's in power. And I think that's a really important distinction. I think Christian nationalism is, at some level, much more involved and embedded in our churches than I used to want to admit. I think that it's hard growing up in a white Christian church not to breathe the air of Christian nationalism. Not all have gone to the full level of now, hey, let's go to, you know, win elected office and let's start, you know, changing the laws to give ourselves special rights and let's start, you know, codifying this in our public schools. But that's the logical progression of what we're being raised on in our churches in the pews from the, from the moment we start attending. Story at 11, the push to put the Lord's scripture into Florida public schools just got another nudge from a state senator. The words in God we trust will be required reading in Louisiana schools this year. A new rule could allow foster care and adoption agencies to deny their services to LGBTQ couples for religious reasons. I think as you look at American history, the debate about what should be the relationship between church and state, I mean, it goes back to the be beginning. There, there had not been a government that had decided to separate church and state like we did. But th that strand pops up. We saw it pop up multiple times. Uh, you know, for example, we saw it pop up really strong in the 1950s. That's when we put under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. It's when we adopted in God we trust. And it's not happening in a vacuum. It's happening because we're in the middle of a cold war against that atheistic Soviet Union. And so we need to conjure up that God is on our side. We are definitely seeing another wave. It's coming back again. And I think this time it's this concern that we, the white evangelical, white Christians, are losing control of our country. This bill, as written, does create a significant establishment problem by saying that religious groups have special privileges and rights over other groups. And this is, I've seen the look of surprise on legislators when I will announce at the beginning of a testimony in a hearing that I'm a Baptist minister and I am opposing this bill to promote Christianity in public schools precisely because of my faith. These bills don't come out of nowhere. They, they definitely come from this ideology that starts with this myth about the founding of America, that somehow we were started as a Christian nation. Part of the idea of America as a Christian nation and a Christian culture is deeply rooted in understanding of the family. I don't think many churches are trying to face the, the, the challenges of the LGBTQ community and the challenges of some of these other issues that they're concerned about. But I do see many churches, especially certain denominations, kind of what we might say doubling down on their traditional beliefs. I think that I always knew that I was transgender from a young age. I didn't officially come out until I was in my 20s. After coming out, I decided to get the hysterectomy. I have a team of doctors and healthcare professionals, mental health care professionals that I go to, um, that I started you know, hormone therapy with and saw regularly. It was a decision that we all made together that it was medically necessary for me to get the hysterectomy. St. Joe's Hospital is, we have a very long relationship. It's my neighborhood hospital. I lost three grandparents at St. Joe's. I lost my mother at St. Joe's. I've spent time myself there as a patient. So it was a place that I was comfortable with. After we had decided that the hysterectomy was what was needed to do next, I was referred to Dr. Day by a family friend. I made an appointment. I went to see him. He seemed very supportive. I was willing to schedule the surgery. Then everything changed. That's when I received an email from Father Rooney of the hospital that stated that as a Catholic hospital, they would not allow my surgeon to schedule the surgery at St. Joe's. When the hospital denied me medically necessary care, I was in shock because if it's something that I need, how can a hospital deny you? I, I couldn't understand it. I took it as I was being discriminated against. 
I was extremely upset. I was embarrassed. I felt humiliated. Um, I was hurt. We were just born into the wrong body. That, that's, that's what it is. Why would it be, not be okay for a trans person to get healthcare that they need? We all have our different beliefs, but I think globally we should all believe in everybody being able to have equal rights and the right to health care and I don't think anybody sh should have an excuse to not provide those simple things in life. This is an issue related to Christian schools, Christian colleges, um, Christian businesses. White evangelicals want to be able to say, I will not bake a cake for a gay wedding. If they're a pharmacist, they want to say, I'm not going to sell morning after contraceptives. It is essentially taking the 14th Amendment and civil rights versus the First Amendment, religious liberty. This is not easily decided because both of these, both of these um, sides are gonna have legitimate arguments to make on this point. I, I think many who leave the faith of their parents uh, are concerned about the fact that politics has in some ways infiltrated the church and caused divisions. It's been particularly acute, I think, during the Trump uh, age, but this has been a problem, I think, for the last 40 years or so. And it's really turning people off to, uh, to Christianity. I think there are people who think being a Christian means being intolerant. It means spewing hatred and bitterness. It means not caring about those who suffer, who are hurting, who are wounded in this country, just to make sure that they maintain their power and privilege. We are an ever-evolving community of visionaries, dreamers, and doers. The way I understand the teaching of the carpenter is that we all, as human beings, are open and affirming. When you do that, you don't have to pick and choose who you affirm. Well, we affirm the LGBTQ community. Well, over here, we affirm single black mothers with three children. Over here, we affirm single dads who are trying to make... No, we affirm human beings. And in this space, which it should be, all human beings ought to find a resting place and a space of affirmation. There are a lot of young people here, in spite of what the statistics say, because they don't find a space that is intolerant and rigid. We have told people in the world's wealthiest supposedly country that it's okay that you do not have food to eat at night. It's okay you don't have a place to sleep at night. It's okay that you're homeless and hungry. It's okay that you don't have health care to tend to the basic needs of your life. That that is okay, that is absurd. The problematic nature of this country and Christianity begins in 1619, when the first slaves arrived to this country. If we were a quote-unquote Christian nation, there are certain harsh realities that in many ways define this country that would not exist. So we love the use of the name of Jesus, but we don't honor the teaching. It is Christianity or nothing, and there's no tolerance, acceptance of people of any other faith. For me in, in this church, my focus is so on making sure that we're true to the teachings of the carpenter and living that life and making that word become flesh in our journey as believers, that there's no room or time or space in my teaching or in my faith to hate another religion. I want Christians in office. I want this country to have Christian principles and Christian laws and Christian ways. We're about to lose this country as we've always known it. It's about to become something that a lot of people want, but I don't want it. My parents don't want it. My grandparents don't want it. It's not according to our heritage. That's why I'm fighting so hard to keep it a Christian nation. Does the goal of making America more Christian infringe upon the rights of other faiths? Uh, yes. I think anytime you want to create a Christian nation or any kind of nation, a Muslim nation, a Hindu nation, uh, obviously those who are representative of other religious groups within that country uh, are going to be second class citizens. We're in this phase where we're redefining what religious liberty even means. Now, 
I have to not only try to convince conservatives that we should believe in true religious liberty for all people, I also have to convince liberals that religious liberty is a good thing and not just a weapon of the conservatives. I feel like almost both sides are almost giving up on this true religious liberty idea because it has been so politicized and misused. If someone else's liberty is endangered, all of our liberty is at danger. What's troubling about the Christian right, I think, is not that they're Christian, not that they have a set of beliefs that maybe other people don't have. I think what's troubling is that there doesn't actually seem to be a real investment in finding a way for us to find a way together. And the investment really seems to be in amassing power. Now the Bible says, blessed are the nations that, uh, that, that worship Him. God has blessed America more than any country in the world. We need to protect our religious liberty and we, we need to uh, stand up for our, our rights. If we don't, we'll lose them. What I'm actually thinking about right now is uh, how it says nights across here and hearing the whole entire team doing the nights and spelling it out while we're doing uh, the jumping jacks. If we have to take this to the Supreme Court, I will because I will not give up my rights as an American and nobody should have to do that. If that's not worth fighting for, I don't, I don't know what is. Hey, thanks for checking out CBS and Originals on YouTube. If you want to watch more documentaries, download the free CBS News app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or any streaming device. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here. Thanks for watching.